Um, I'm going to get straight into this because we have uh, very little time. Normally, uh, I like doing this over a three hour stretch. So given that we have about an hour and 15 minutes, I'm going to go straight into it. Usually, what I do is uh, in two parts. The first part is the bad news. The second part is the good news. Uh, so the first part essentially looks at uh, the impacts that economic development and especially globalized economic development in the last 20 years has had, but also from earlier periods, both on the environment and on people. And as I'll try and show throughout, these two cannot be disconnected in a country like India. Uh, and then the second part looks at uh, if, if there's a serious fundamental problem with, with this model of economic development that we followed, are there alternatives? Is there another way of meeting human needs uh, while not trashing the earth and while not leaving half of humanity behind. So in the, today, the first part I'm going to do in like five minutes because partly because of lack of time, but also partly I think this audience doesn't really need too much uh, uh, more stuff on the bad news. You are reading it in the newspapers every day and in any case, you're all, most of you are working on these sorts of issues. So that part I'm going to do very quickly. Uh, basically, just to, to reiterate, uh, refresh our minds on the fact that we are currently in the midst of fairly severe crises of various kinds. Uh, for those of us who are worried about what's happening to the environment, of course, there's the whole ecological unsustainability of this model of development, which is shown in study after study after study, looking at what are the Earth's ecological limits and how we're sort of crossing those uh, limits in various different ways. Just one study, for example, called the Ecological Footprint Study, shows that we are currently at 1.5 times what the earth can provide. So we're already in that sense, eating into the earth's uh, resources and, and eating into what the next generation should actually have available to it. Uh, and the same can be said about what's happening in India. We have given in the book that Kavita referred to, uh, we've given lots of sort of facts and figures of what's happening to, uh, to the environment in India. The second part is equally important. And it's, of course, related also to ecological unsustainability, uh, especially given the fact that in a country like India, very large majority of the population is still directly dependent on natural resources for their day-to-day -day livelihood and for survival. Of course, ultimately, we're all dependent on nature and natural resources. We wouldn't be alive without nature. But this direct day-to-day -day dependence is something that means that if the ecological, if ecological damage does take place, then there is a direct impact on people's survival and livelihoods. But also, that in many other ways, this form of economic development has created wider gaps between the rich and the poor. It hasn't necessarily benefited the, uh, the really poor, uh, very poor people. It's created new forms of poverty and deprivation, etc. There's lots of facts and figures in the book if anybody's interested. Uh, and I think, Kavita, we probably should mention there's also a um, sort of an extreme summary of the book. Uh, here in 20 pages, which, which also has a lot of these facts, figures, and analyses. Uh, but the third aspect is equally important, which is that it's not just the physical uh, manifestations of what economic development does to, it, to, does to us, it's also what's happening to us in terms of our own psyches and our, our, our emotion and our, the, our connect with nature and with each other. And I think that's actually getting worse in the sense of we're getting more and more disconnected from nature and I think living in Bangalore one doesn't need to elaborate on that, uh, but also from each other. And I think the, the sense of community spirit, collective spirit, etc., to my mind, seems to be going down uh, the more our modern philosophical or lack of philosophical uh, approach tells us that we basically, each one of us is an individual and we need to get more famous and more rich and more powerful, etc., etc. I, me, myself, selfie as the newest word in the Oxford English Dictionary. Uh, and so therefore, I think <clears throat> if you look at, uh, I find advertisements are a very good way of understanding today's reality. So this one uh, is, the first one on the left is actually an advertisement from about 25 years back, could, but could well be from today, uh, which is an Indian, multi, uh, Indian multinational corporation. And if you, the, the language there, I don't know if you can read it there, but I'll just quickly read it out to you. It says, all over the world, nature's mighty barriers separate oil, gas, minerals, and water from their destinations. <laughs> okay, so first of all, nature is a, ma as a barrier, not something that we live on. Only a handful of international giants can bridge these gaps. One of them is Indian, Dotsal, ripping through jungles in Indonesia, moving the earth in India, laying pipelines. 
Now, for many of us, this is a ridiculous imagery, but actually this is currently the model of development that is predominant, right? Maybe this kind of advertisement will not be repeated because ad agencies are getting cleverer, but it's still the, and the, I think the only thing missing here is there should have been a bunch of Adivasis also falling off from this forest. Um, anyway, so that's from 25 years back. This is uh, this year, 26th of January this year. The Ministry of Rural Development issued this advertisement on uh, Republic Day. Uh, they may or may not have meant it, I don't know. But essentially, if you look at it, the dominant image here is of an army jawan. And actually, many parts of India, development, rural or urban, does happen at the barrel of a gun, literally or figuratively. It actually does happen through force, violence, uh, and so on. Uh, and we see that with the kind of land conflicts that are taking place all across the country. So development essentially has come to mean violence, whether it's against nature or it's against uh, people or against cultures. And India's development now is doing to some parts of the rest of the world what Britain's development did to us, which is that we are actually becoming a colonizing nation. You can see this happening in Ethiopia where, in fact, this is an old figure now, about half a million hectares of land has been taken up by Indian companies to produce things which are for mostly for export to Europe. And these are lands that are not just lying empty. They are actually lands where pastoralists or farmers or others are actually dependent on them. They get kicked out. And uh, Ethiopia is extremely br brutal. So anybody protesting actually disappears, gets imprisoned, or actually gets killed. So this is, uh, this is us as, as a colonial um, country more and more so. China, of course, is still ahead of us. But we're also getting there. And so finally, to end this part of the talk, I think it's something that Gandhiji said six, seven decades back is really coming true. Uh, Europe and the US already did strip part of the world uh, bare. We are following in the same footsteps and with several times more the population, that model of development will simply not sustain the earth. So it's something that we have to seriously fundamentally question. It's not about doing some amount of tweaking here and there and saying, okay, we'll do economic, what green economic growth and stuff like that or uh, CSR activities and corporations, etc. I'm sorry if anybody here is from a corporation, but those are those are you know trying to basically create facades of green, which don't really help with dealing with the system. We need fundamentally different pathways. What are these pathways? Now, what I'll do now is to very quickly go through a series of examples of what's actually happening in India, what people are trying on the ground, and then from that try and develop some sort of a broad framework of what could be an alternative vision for human well-being. So quickly, let's take a look at uh, some of the, the key sectors of basic needs, right? So food and agriculture. We've had in the last uh, few decades a model of green revolution where it's essentially been about pump more and more and more fertilizers, pesticides, high yielding varieties of seeds, irrigation, etc., etc., into the land and keep growing the amount of food grains that we produce. To some extent, that's been successful, but at the cost of the soil, the land, people's health, uh, to the extent that Punjab now runs cancer express, uh, cancer trains from Punjab into Rajasthan where people get treatment, where the cancer is mostly caused by pesticides and other chemical exposure. So do we have an alternative to this? And I think, uh, let me just give you two examples quickly. This many of you might be familiar with, but essentially it's uh, Dalit women farmers in about 70, 75 villages, which have, who have challenged their traditionally uh, disprivileged status as women, as Dalits, and as small farmers. These are essentially half an acre, one acre, one and a half, two acres land, so very small farmers. So they're triple dis disprivileged in traditional Indian society. They've actually challenged that by forming collectivities, sanghas as they call them, and um, doing all their agricultural operations as collectives, which means sharing the seeds, bringing back a lot of the traditional uh, seed diversity, especially millets like ragi and jawar and bajra, and uh, uh, com switching completely to organic. Uh, but crucial breakthroughs that they've made through all this is, is uh, two or three things. Number one, creating community grain banks so that the poor who may not have access to good seeds for planting and cannot buy them from corporations, don't have access to government uh, grains, etc. They, they have that access. In each village, they have that grain bank. The only condition being you can take it free, but if you get a good harvest, give double the amount back. Right? 
So that's how the banks kind of keep running. They've also created a alternative public distribution system. Now we all know, I don't know if, if any, any of you have ever been to a ration shop, but we know the way ration shops run. I mean, there's, there's first of all, there's corruption all the way from the top to the bottom, but also food grains that are given to the poor, are extremely poor quality. And it's only rice and wheat. So what they've done is they've created a parallel system, PDS system, in which the local organic millets, local rice varieties, local pulses are actually put. Because they're local, they're, they're, you know, they're reasonable in terms of cost, etc. And it also means that farmers have an incentive to keep growing those things to be able, so that because there's a market available locally. So they, it's, it's a creating, creating an actually an economic cycle, uh, which is self-sustaining in many different ways. Uh, through all of this, of course, because of the way they've mobilized themselves, uh, this has now manifested in many other sectors. So the women run a filmmaking unit. They have by now made about 75 movies, uh, not just on their own work, but all kinds of other things. Uh, they run a community radio, which goes out to 150 villages or something like that. They have started their own school where they do different forms of teaching of, uh, of the kids there and so on. It's a long story, I'm cutting very short, but uh, it's, it's quite, and essentially through all of this, what they're saying is that if it's about our lives uh, and our food and our water and our economic, you know, our livelihoods and jobs, then we should be the ones in control. And we want to do it in a very different way from how the dominant system has told us to do it. This is an individual, again, a very interesting story. 12, 13 years back, he was doing chemical farming like all of his neighbors. He then, uh, he saw the negative impacts of that and he started, he switched to organic. He's then gone around Odisha, Chhattisgarh, uh, and looked at where traditional rice varieties still exist, collected 360 varieties, is growing them on small plots of land, puts down all his uh, observations in this kind of these sheets, goes back to farmers and tries to convince them to actually grow uh, these varieties, which are completely organic, no use of fertilizers, pesticides, etc. And he claims that his productivity is as high as the productivity of the chemical-based farmers in his area. I was joking with him saying that you can eat a new variety of rice every day of the year. And he said, uh, sort of seriously looked at me and said, no, no, not yet. I still need five more varieties. <laughs> By now he might have them because this is already from two years back. So the question that arises from this is that can we actually, can India feed itself through organic farming? So this, is a, this is a serious question that we always get asked. And of course, it's not easy to give a very, you can't statistically prove that it is possible. But through the examples that are increasing all across the country now, there are dozens of them, probably hundreds. It, it seems fairly evident that we can, provided we think of productivity in terms of not just the food grain, not just the milk in the milk revolution, not just the fish in the blue revolution, etc., but in a more holistic sense. The productivity of the land from the point of view of grains, fodder, uh, different kinds of foods, uh, wild foods, etc., etc., if we took that you know, what used to be very often there in some tra traditional integrated food systems, we find that this kind of farming or agricultural or pastoral systems are far more productive. But the other big issue that arises there is how do you reclaim um, the uh, lands which have gone from food into non-food cash crops, you know, tobacco. In, my, in the state I live in, Maharashtra, sugarcane. Uh, these are hard political questions, but if one is able to tackle these things, then there is no, I don't think there's any doubt that we can actually feed ourselves with organic, biologically diverse uh, farming. Let's take water. Again, the model so far has been uh, that if there's a area like Rajasthan or Kutch or dry land of uh, Deccan Plateau, which doesn't have enough, enough rainfall, then put a dam somewhere where there is lots of rainfall and then carry the water across through large scale canal systems including this MAD scheme that was being proposed called the Garland scheme, which our ex-president also seemed to be very fond of. Fortunately, it hasn't yet happened. But uh, that's been the model, and uh, that has, of course, created huge problems in terms of displacement, uh, water logging, salinization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Are there alternatives? And I think these are stories that many of you might be familiar with. But for instance, if you look at what's happened in a couple of hundred villages in Rajas in Alwar district in Rajasthan. So this is an example from one river basin called Arvari, where all the villages of that basin have said that we want to look at this, not just each village individually, but as a, 
as a landscape, as a larger landscape. So they've, did, they've made these small johars, small structures to store the water and it's a cascading kind of a system by which the Arvari river has been transformed from being four or five months, uh, running for four or five months to becoming a perennial river. Of course, then crop productivity has significantly uh, uh, gone up. Uh, there is no water shortage anymore for drinking, etc. But to me, what's interesting really here is the institutional structure that they've made, the, which they call the Arvari Sansad. So all those 65 villages have got together to make a parliament, a people's parliament. And decision making for the basin as a whole happens through that uh, that people's parliament, which includes not just water, but also lots of other kinds of issues, law and order, inter-village conflicts, um, forest protection, hunting is completely banned, and because I mentioned sugarcane earlier, uh, cropping patterns also. So they collectively decided, for instance, that nobody would grow sugarcane for any commercial purpose, because that would then mean that water sustainability would completely be thrown out of the window. Uh, Kutch groups have worked there in about 100 villages to show that India's lowest rainfall region can still be water self-sufficient without any Narmada dams to bring water there uh, through either traditional systems which they already had and have revived or new ones and it's sort of matching or putting together their own traditional knowledge with modern geological knowledge of drainage and water patterns and underground water patterns etc water flows uh, to be able to uh, better recreate what was there or create new ones, new structures that could be sustained. Then uh, we take nature, nature na other natural resources. And uh, one of the examples that I'm very fond of giving is I think quite a remarkable little village called Mindhalekha in Maharashtra in Gachiroli district, the heartland of uh, Naxalite India where uh, over the last about 30 years, after having been involved in a, uh, a very strong Adivasi movement against two big dams on the Indravati River, which they stopped, those dams were never built, the village kind of said that it's not just what we're fighting about, which is coming from outside us, but even internally within the village, there are lots of issues. You know, there are some people who are cutting off, cutting down the timber and, and selling it off. Uh, there are issues of uh, within the tribe itself, inequalities and things like that, women's involvement in decision making and so on. So they uh, created or recreated uh, their Gram Sabha or the village assembly and uh, uh, they said that everybody in the village has to be involved in this. There's no Gram Pradhans, Sarpanches, etc. The entire village gets involved, including the children and all decisions are taken by consensus through the Gram Sabha, which could mean that I mean, if you think that people like us have lots of seminars, you should go to this village. There's a meeting happening sometime or the other, all the time there are meetings taking place. Uh, and that happens either through the village assembly, but they also have what they call study circles, abhyas gut, similar to what we do, where if somebody in the village feels that they don't have enough information about something, some particular problem, like let's say honey production in the forest is going down or forest fire is taking place somewhere and they're not sure whether it's good or bad for the forest. They'll discuss it in that study circle. They will also invite professors or NGOs or whatever from outside and say, okay, you tell us what you think about this. And then through that, the information that is arrived at is fed into the Gram Sabha, which is then able to take a more informed uh, decision. Yeah. And now, through all of this, they have taken control over 1800 hectares of forests. They now have full legal control over it under the Forest Rights Act, which came up in 2006. They have kicked out a paper mill and they now do their own sustainable harvesting of bamboo through which they have earned a crore of rupees in the last three years. All the money has gone into a Gram Sabha fund, which is used for being used for all this. Um, and just two months back, pretty revolutionary, they all the private agricultural land of the village was donated into the village commons. So now there's no private property ownership in the village at all. Um, Again, lots more one can say about it, but uh, this is a snapshot. If you look at a similar, if not necessarily as revolutionary uh, attempts of nat natural resource conservation or nature protection, etc., there's thousands of stories around India. Uh, we have been able to document about 150 case studies from different parts of the country, but there are lots, lots, lots more, which are about uh, protecting forests, protecting wetlands, uh, beach stretches, coral reefs, mangroves, wildlife populations, etc. There are all kinds of different motivations. Some of them are ethical motivations that these are 
like for instance on the Odisha coast, a couple of villages protecting uh, turtle nesting sites because these are sea turtles coming from very far away and they said these are our guests. We cannot allow their nests to be broken or their eggs to be stolen, etc. So there are ethical concerns, cultural concerns, livelihood issues, political reasons, all kinds of different motivations that actually come together in these different uh, institutions, these different initiatives. Uh, using the same legislation that I mentioned earlier with Mendha Lekha, now communities have also actually started reversing 150 years of colonial rule by which there was a centralized forest department that was controlling all of or most of India's forests. They now have the ability to reclaim those lands and be able to use, manage and protect those forests. So they're doing that not just for forests, but also now they're using this increasingly, oops, sorry, against uh, 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 development projects that are that are otherwise causing destruction and, and devastation and displacement. For instance, the famous ones, of course, are uh, Vedanta, where 12 Gram Sabhas have refused permission to uh, to a mining company. Uh, POSCO, what for the last seven or eight years, they've been resisting it. Of course, the Forest Rights Act is not the only thing that is being used, but it's one of the tools that they use for uh, securing their rights and then being able to stop or resist these projects. The next uh, basic need, of course, is livelihood, jobs. Now, livelihood could be either in terms of securing their traditional livelihoods, which are not jobs as such, but, you know, whatever they're doing in their forests or fishing communities or whatever, or they could be new jobs that are needed, especially with newer generations uh, coming up. And I think the, the crucial issue to remember here also is that the current form of development has hardly created, if you look at the formal sector economy, which is where most of the money is going, in the last 20 years, according to official statistics, from about 27 to 0.3 million uh, people employed in the formal sector, today is 30 million. So virtually no change, almost no change. Why? Because that's a sector where increasing mechanization and automation has actually, at the same time, new jobs are being created, other jobs are being, uh, people are being laid off. We see that happening all across. For instance, Tata Steel, produces five times more steel today than it did 20 years back with one third the workforce. Okay, so that's what's happening in that sector. Uh, so if, if anybody says that we need this form of economic development for jobs, it's a lie. It's a big, 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 big lie. What are the other forms? Can there be other forms of actually creating jobs? And I'm going to give you two or three examples. One is a state government example, and I think it's very well, well worth talking about because one sees then that it's not only the civil society which do, is doing this, sometimes good things can happen within the government sector also. So this is a state government uh, corporation called Jharkraft, which over the last six years has reached out to two and a half lakh families of handloom weavers, silk, uh, silk uh, make, you know, silk textile makers, uh, metal workers, bamboo, bamboo and cane workers, uh, artists, musicians, etc. Mostly traditional skills, some of them being upgraded, they worked with a whole lot of design uh, institutions like NID, et cetera, to create new designs, still using the traditional motifs and all that, but creating new products like, I don't know, laptop cases or whatever. And uh, uh, enabling the cooperatives to be revived, especially handloom cooperatives, which had died down because of government neglect, sort of enabling them to be revived there. And most crucially, providing the marketing links so that the products that are being made are, are, being, are able to be marketed eliminating the middleman so that the revenues that are being generated are mostly going back to the original producers and not going to retailers and middlemen, et cetera, which is what normally tends to happen. So a million people have benefited in just six years through enhanced livelihoods with this kind of an approach. Now just imagine if this is the kind of approach that had been used through small scale urban and rural livelihoods uh, since independence, I don't think we would have had a livelihood or a job problem. But of course, that's not what was followed. Um, similarly, you find in, in a number of other you know, civil society uh, um, attempts at trying to mobilize producers of various kinds to be able to take control over the entire chain from raw materials till the uh, sale, till, till marketing, and therefore be able to earn much more uh, livelihoods but also to increasingly bring in aspects of ecological sustainability, equity in the distribution of benefits and decision making, things like that. And this happens especially with producer companies uh, like the ones I've given here. Let me just give you one quick example. 
This is from a group called Timbuktu Collective, very close to Bangalore, three hours north of here, where uh, several villages have, uh, the farmers in several villages have got together to form this company, which then is marketing its stuff uh, as organic produce. Um, and uh, again, the benefits uh, largely go back to the producers themselves. And this, all the decision making happens through the producer company and not by any NGO or capitalist or whatever. In all of these, I'm giving you the good news stuff. All of them, are, none of them are perfect. There's lots of problems in many of them. There are issues of, they, they might be democratic in many ways, but there are, inherent, there are inherent inequalities that come in between say men and women, et cetera. So those issues are there. But compared to what has conventionally existed, there uh, are significant improvements. The crucial question that comes up here is the relationship between the city and the village. Actually, you'll notice that most of the examples I've given so far are of, are of rural areas. Um, but I will hopefully also give a couple from cities. But uh, the relationship as it exists right now, and I'm being simplistic here, is extremely exploitative, which is to say that the city is ex exploitative of the village in the form of grabbing a lot of the resources, whether it's land or it's water or it's other natural resources, minerals, etc., and giving back uh, garbage. So this is uh, dump from outside Mumbai. In Pune, we have this huge problem right now, which I think is a legitimate, uh, it's a problem we deserved, which is that the villages where our garbage was being dumped has said that enough is enough, we don't want any more of your garbage. So you know, garbage begins to pile up in Pune streets and everybody starts screaming and saying, why is garbage not being collected? Nobody actually looks at the fact that we are the ones responsible for creating that garbage in the first place and we should be dealing with it. But anyway, so that exploitative relationship uh, needs to be dealt with. One of the, and I think there are two ways, to, at least two ways to do it. One is to ask this question of why is it that there's such a incredible rural urban migration? So of course there's attraction, there's many other things that work in this, but a part of it is also sheer desperation. People simply don't have the economic options or their social oppression and exploitation in villages, so they're driven out in ways. So there's a push and a pull effect. At least for the push effect, we're beginning to see examples of villages which are reviving or revitalizing themselves in such ways that people are no longer having to migrate out of uh, desperation and in some cases have actually migrated back. These are three villages that I know of where uh, reverse migration has taken place. People had moved out. The earlier example I gave of Jharkraft in Jharkhand, uh, some of the couple of villages that I went to, the families were extremely happy because sons who had gone out to work in Raipur in a Maruti showroom or whatever had actually come back to work on handlooms because they were going to be earning virtually the same thing with much less exploitative conditions and be with their families. Uh, so you're beginning to actually, and this is of course not just about economics, it's also a larger change in the village social economic, uh, socioeconomic uh, uh, structures, including things like caste exploitation and so on and so forth. So it's a, it's a more holistic change that needs to take place, but it is happening in a few areas. And I think this is something we need to really work on much harder to be able to see, can this become something much more widespread so that the kind of rural urban migration we're seeing can be stemmed, there's nothing inevitable about it. And that basic questioning has to happen. Uh, but then of course cities will remain and will continue growing at least until a certain time. So we need to deal with that. And that's of course something that at IIHS, I feel even hesitant to talk about because you folks are more experts here than I am. But just an example that I've seen, which I think is a very interesting one for an urban situation. Bhuj of course is a small town, it's not a big city. So you can't replicate everything that's happening there into a big city, but there are some good things happening there. So for instance, slums, four of the slums in Bhuj have recreated or created new water harvesting systems by which they're now 100% self-sufficient. They don't need water from the municipality or in any other, there, there are no tankers anymore coming into those colonies. They've made water management committees by which they do all the governance and management of, of that water. Similarly, housing, in some of these areas through the, uh, oh sorry, you were asking about the organizations, right? Uh, these are the groups, the civil society groups that work there. Uh, Hunar Shala, for instance, works on uh, on uh, alternative architecture and, and housing, low cost housing, etc. So they've helped to develop uh, housing models whereby uh, slum dwellers, very poor people can actually have affordable housing. Of course, the big issue there as, as, as everywhere else in cities is that slums are technically illegal. So the whole issue of land rights is also something they're fighting for. 
I think the most important here thing here, of course, is not just the physical stuff that's happening, which is crucial and, and very inspiring, but this empowerment. If you have a 74th Amendment, a constitutional amendment, which is supposed to empower urban citizens to be part of decision making and has hardly ever been used anywhere in the country, this is an example where they're able to do that through mobilizing people, through providing an information service called Setu, uh, where anybody, any urban citizen, especially the poor, can come in and get all the information they need about the sorts of schemes they're supposed to be entitled to, uh, the kinds of facilities, having a bridge between the officials responsible for doing things and not doing them, and then the citizens are able to actually get, make them more accountable, uh, et cetera. So this, this, this whole thing is, extremely interesting as a model of what could happen. Of course, very initial stages in many things, but uh, showing very, very good results already. In Pune, we have uh, probably India's largest, I think, um, union uh, and cooperative of waste picker, uh, waste pickers, mostly women, where again over the last few years, because of their unionizing, because they've mobilized themselves, they've been able to actually fight for and obtain much more uh, secure livelihoods, much healthier conditions, uh, uniforms, vehicles to take the, the, the garbage, et cetera, and contracts with the corporation by which they have actually full responsibility and power, sorry, and, and rights for the waste collection in a substantial part of Pune. Um, Again, very, very interesting long story, but apart from that, you know, you, you, you see how initiatives like this in one sector actually have spin-offs in other sectors. So for instance, now from a zero uh, rate of children going to school, 100% of their children are now going to school. Of course, the quality of schools is a separate issue, but you know, school going is significantly increased. They now have access to doctors. Earlier they didn't, they were not, they didn't have health access. They now have much better relationships with the people from whom they're collecting waste, who earlier used to think of them as kande log, you know, keep them apart kind of thing. There are now actual social relationships that actually start getting built up, etc. So it is a much more dignified and secure livelihood that can be provided to amongst the most, uh, the weakest sections of urban population. Of course, if you're talking about sustainable and equitable cities, there's you know, uh, out of 100 miles, 99 miles still to go. It's still very, very initial stages. I think you'd all be familiar with some of the things that are happening in Bangalore, Chennai, Pune, and things like that, to, on things like water, waste, uh, sanitation, and, and so on. It's in, interesting initiatives, but still fairly small scale. Uh, public transport, people talk about Ahmedabad. I don't know, some of you might know whether it's good or not, but the bus transport system in Ahmedabad. Um, and in Pune, two colonies have decided on being zero waste colonies. So there's this stuff happening, but still very preliminary. And you'd be able to tell me more about what's happening. And I think there's, of course, learnings from other countries that we could probably uh, look at on what more can happen. Then if we look at uh, other sectors, um, I spoke about the school that the uh, Tech and Development Society, the Dalit women run, it's called Pachashala. And what I find very interesting there, and in fact in all of these other initiatives also which are listed here, is the attempt to try and put together uh, formal systems of learning with informal or non-formal systems of learning in which it's not only PhD scholars who are teachers, but also the village, you know, sugar making expert of the village, uh, uh, the, the expert in growing ragi, who is also a teacher, right? I attended one session uh, on physics and chemistry at the Pachashala, which was outdoors, where the kids were actually making uh, sugarcane juice, and they were being taught physics and chemistry with the properties of the sugarcane juice. So, you know, you get the practical skills, you're outdoors, you, you learn that traditional knowledge is as much uh, as respectful as, as modern knowledge is, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's, I think it's very, very interesting initiative. And of course, then you remain also rooted to your own local environments to, to a certain extent, you know, the nature or the agricultural systems, et cetera. Uh, similar things are happening in elsewhere. I think in terms of colleges, the Adivasi Academy in Gujarat is very interesting, looking at how college students can continue to remain, to, to retain their Adivasi roots but also go into engineering or computers, whatever else they want to, but actually have roots back in their, uh, in their own histories, in their own cultures, and their own environments. 
This is close to Vadodara, it's called Tejpur. There's a group called Bhasha that set it up. You may have heard of Ganesh Devi, who's a very famous linguist, a language expert, who's just recently finished, I think, the most comprehensive survey of Indian languages. And he says that India doesn't have 20 major languages or whatever, it's got 1200 languages. And those are not dialects, What's according to him. Ganesh Devi. Ganesh. Finally, then, of course, the sector of technology, um, including housing, energy, etc., where again, there's some amazing stuff happening, incredible stuff happening out there, meant not so much to increase the profits of, co of corporations, but actually to get access to communities and, and poor people, whether it's housing or it's, uh, sorry, uh, energy. I just yesterday was in Udupi, where Selco is doing some really good work on providing solar lighting to the poorest families, not as charity, but actually through a system by which they are able to buy and own that lighting. And, it, and it's created some very interesting uh, results in terms of better educational opportunities, livelihood opportunities, etc. I was also in Udupi in a slum, in an urban slum, they've done a very similar thing. Uh, Bihar has a couple of new initiatives on how you could make entire uh, villages and maybe small populations in small towns energy self-sufficient through decentralized, renewable, integrated systems. I mean, of course, all this kind of churning happens uh, within society. Uh, governments are also forced to respond. There are always good people within government wanting to do things differently. And I think if you look at some of the legislation that's come, with all their attendant problems, nevertheless uh, progressive. And for instance, the RTI, uh, which came about because of mobilization in Rajasthani villages and then Delhi and various other places, eventually leading to becoming a national legislation, is uh, it's pretty path-breaking, I, I would say. Probably India's most revolutionary law since independence. Um, and many others, plus uh, programs, schemes. So for instance, 16 states now have organic farming programs or policies. Some have declared like Sikkim that by 2015 it will be 100% organic. Uh, Kerala says by 2020, it's a bit of a question mark right now. But these things do begin to happen, fits and starts and with lots of problems, but you begin to see that policy changes can also happen, which then make it easier to spread these initiatives on a larger scale. I don't mean upscaling, meaning replicating exactly the same thing, but the principles and, the, and, and so on which are being used could actually be uh, made much more widespread. Nagaland has a very interesting communitization program. I think the only state in the country where a substantial part of the budgets of the departments are given to the village council to completely control, which means that if the, this is for health, education, power, and one or two other sectors. So if the school teacher doesn't come, he or she will not get a salary because it's the village assembly that pays the salary, not the government department. And in the last six, seven years, that has increased attendance of health workers and school teachers by some 80 to 85 percent. Just this one simple step of devolving the control over the uh, money. Yeah, so putting this together into some sort of a broad framework, a very, very broad framework, okay, there's not a blueprint for an alternative uh, India, but it's a very broad framework of what could, what we could think of, the lessons from all these initiatives. If you look at these initiatives, one of the most crucial things here is that they're, they're expressing the fact that they're not satisfied with democracy in the form of voting once in five years but democracy in the form of them being part of decision making for things that are affecting their lives. So direct democracy, we've called it radical democracy. There's many different terms that are used. So that's a very crucial part of the, and it's a very dramatic shift if you look at it. So Menha Lekha has a slogan, that village I spoke about, which says in Bombay and Delhi is our government. In our village, we are the government. Okay, so see the difference here. So the representative thing there, but a direct democracy where we're living. And the same could apply to cities. If you look at it, I mean, again, the, the spirits of the 73rd and 74, the constitutional amendment was precisely this. In actual practice, very little has happened. But where people are beginning to uh, mobilize themselves, it is beginning to happen. But the, this form of direct democracy also needs to be sensitive to issues of equity, social, economic equity, and so on. And ecological sustainability. So putting all that together, called it radical ecological democracy, don't worry about the name. Uh, you, 
any name will will do. But essentially, it's the principles that are that are. Oh, and by the way, the uh, nobody believes me on this, but uh, this this came up first, and then the acronym came later. <laughs> but nobody believes me, so I stopped saying it. <laughs> okay. Now I think the most, and I'm going to end uh, after this soon. Uh, to me, the most important thing is not the physical aspects of what these initiatives have done. That is, of course, important. But it's the principles underlying, the values underlying these initiatives. So here's the initial set of what has come up. Uh, this is not created in my mind. This is basically what people have been saying. So when you talk to them about, okay, what is, what's underlying what you're doing? Not just the water structure or the waste picking or whatever, but what is, what are the values underlying it? And this is an initial list. And I think it's a very interesting list because in many ways, it actually challenges our current dominant worldviews. Which, so take, let's say, this cooperation, collectivity, and commons. Now, if you look at the current dominant worldview, it's everything is about the individual, the selfish individual, I, me, mine. Uh, whereas these initiatives are saying it cannot work like that. It has to be in collectives and commons. Everything needs to be in commons, including ideas. Intellectual property rights don't make sense. Ideas and, and, and knowledge has to be part of the commons. So, even, for instance, the whole open software movement or, and things like that is, is part of that. Uh, or you take anything else, happiness. What is happiness? The Reliance would have us believe that happiness is about having a 50-inch television. <laughs> if you only have a 40-inch one, that's not happiness enough. Okay, but maybe happiness is really about better social relationships, more opportunities for learning, opportunities to grow as a human being, uh, satisfaction with what one has. There's lots of different things uh, that come in in the play here. I, I mean, I can talk on and on about each of these values, but just wanted to put up a, uh, an initial list for, you know, for discussion and uh, for people to start adding more or uh, challenging them, etc. Now, all of this has been developed much further in the form of uh, four aspects of radical ecological democracy. I'm not going to go into them because of lack of time. We need a different form of politics. I've already talked about radical or direct democracy. But of course, direct democracy can only happen in small scale. The larger the scale you get, you will need some form of delegation or rep representativeness. How do you then ensure that those representatives are accountable to that grassroots uh, democracy are issues that, that have to be dealt with. And there are some interesting examples of where that is happening, both within India and outside. For instance, what's happening in Venezuela right now is really fascinating, some of it. Um, this is a, a potentially very subversive um, idea, which again is happening in some parts of the world, where you start saying that political boundaries as they are right now don't make sense. If you want to do planning or decision making, which is ecologically sensitive and socially and culturally sensitive, then the boundaries need to be determined on the basis of ecological boundaries and cultural boundaries and not political ones as they are right now which means even nation state boundaries as they are right now have to be challenged. It makes no sense whatsoever to have a boundary bang in the middle of the Sundarbans forest between Bangladesh and India, or bang in the middle of the Himalayan slopes between India and Pakistan or whatever, so, or, or Tibet and India. And seriously, we have to start questioning those nation state boundaries also. But it's a very controversial topic, so I'll leave it at that. We need a new economics. Well, if, uh, if you know anybody who's done economics, you will actually uh, find that one of the basics of economics is that there are no ecological limits. And if you start putting ecological limits, the whole economics theory has to be upturned. And there are people now who are actually trying to evolve new, a new theoretical economics based on ecological limits and other aspects. It also means that, for instance, the indicators of well-being are no longer about gross domestic product and per capita income and blah, 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 but actually much more meaningful things like, do people really have clean water? Do they have adequate nutritious food? Are they happy? Uh, do they have satisfactory relationships, etc.? It also, then the third pillar of this, of course, is justice, social justice. I don't think I need to talk about this, but we need, of course, far more work on issues of justice amongst uh, genders, caste, classes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Fourth and finally is uh, culture and knowledge, where uh, being able to relink with the rest of, reconnect with the rest of nature, think of knowledge ju not just in the domain of the formal universities and so on, but on a, in a much broader sense, 
uh, and of course then talk about personal and community spiritual uh, opportunities. So there's, there's a whole bunch of this here. And I should say very clearly here that I'm not talking about falling into the trap of uh, dogmatic religious fundamentalism here. So, okay, I'm going to skip all this for lack of time, but basically to say there are lots of false solutions out there. Ecology as a fashion is a false solution. You look at all the property ads today, it's about growing, you know, waking up to the sounds of nature, blah, 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 while they're of course busy destroying nature. Uh, there's lots of market solutions, market-based solutions or techno fixes that are being talked about. We have to be beware of them. There's uh, strange uh, bedfellows coming up between communal forces and environmentalists. It's happened in my own experience and we have to be careful about them, etc. What are the pathways to getting to something like a radical ecological democracy? Uh, lots of stuff, people's resistance. If you know, I think at any given time in India, there is resistance to at least 100 different projects going on. Uh, Jharkhand, there are hundreds of MOUs that have been signed, almost none of them have actually got off the ground, partly because of Naxalism, but partly also people's res uh, community resistance to it. So that is one of the crucial things because it provides us also space to develop the proactive alternative answers. Then of course, whole, all sorts of other things are happening which are kind of pathways to getting towards that alternative uh, future. Um, I'm gonna skip this. This, this. I did a paper on, on this, this whole Millennium Development Goals review taking place right now. For those interested in that sort of UN system and all, I can send you the paper. But it's just looking at what, what are, how do you reframe those goals and indicators and all that to bring all these issues in rather than the conventional goals that have been there. Skip that. Okay, end with a series of questions which can be parts of ongoing discussions. In that ideal future, will big industry be needed? I don't know, people tell me that steel cannot be produced without big industry. Others say, why not? We can do technological R&D and actually have small scale steel production. So question, I don't have all the answers right now. Is profits gonna remain a motivation? I personally don't think it needs to, but you know, people can have different views on this. Uh, will the private sector remain alive? Should it remain alive? Question mark. Will the state eventually wither away? Will, will all things, be functions be happening through communities and collectives and therefore we don't need a state? I think for a very long time we do need the state, but it has to be a very different form of, of government than what we have right now, which is more a sort of facilitative uh, guarantor of rights and things like that rather than uh, the top-down controlling nature it has right now. India has got 250 million, million people who are in the middle classes. What's the role? What's our role? Um, <laughs> facilitators, challenging ourselves and our own lifestyles, facilitating what's happening in the grassroots, you know, thinking up new things. There are many possibilities, but it's a, it's a question mark right now. And then, of course, uh, we will need political forces. I don't mean political parties necessarily, but political agents to take this kind of thing forward. We need that larger transformation also. We can't do only with these small scale local initiatives. So what, what is that agency? What is that? Who's playing that kind of role? Uh, this is a bit, despite my nation state thing, this is slightly nationalistic here. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's hard to get it out of my genes. But essentially to say that I think we, you know, the Indian subcontinent, let us say, is, is in a really great position to be able to develop these alternative pathways because of the long history, the civil society activism, the great amount of thinking and churning and the refusal to bow down to uh, army or state uh, power, at least, at least in India, and so on. I think there's, there's a lot of stuff here which, is, which are elements of what could be uh, these alternative pathways. So let me end there and um, a couple of websites which has more information and my email.